I'm uh, Morgan. I'm one of the uh, PGY3s uh, in Emerge, and uh, I have been asked to do a journal club uh, on a topic of high sensitivity troponin uh, for exclusion of acute myocardial infarction. So, just a little bit of background. Um, the literature uh, suggests that up to 10% uh, of uh, emergency department visits uh, are uh, of patients presenting with uh, symptoms suggested, suggestive of uh, uh, AMI. Uh, there is a universal definition of acute myocardial infarction uh, and listed there, and I guess the, uh, the important points are uh, that uh, it requires a uh, rise and or fall of uh, cardiac biomarkers um, with evidence of myocardial ischemia, uh, so in a clinical context, uh, and they sort of define the evidence as uh, either symptoms of ischemia, ECG changes, pathological Q waves, or uh, any uh, imaging that's done. So cardiac troponin is the most sensitive marker for um, ischemia. Um, cardiac troponin is uh, used uh, to, uh, for a diagnosis or exclusion of uh, MI. Uh, the issue has been that um, there's a limit in terms of when you can actually make that diagnosis because of the, t the time it takes for the cardiac troponin to rise in the serum. This leads to patients uh, that often require repeat testing. Um, Thus, patients present a bit of a diagnostic dilemma uh, when you present initially uh, earlier than six hours. So uh, emergency doctors um, that have uh, been doing research in um, AMI have been looking for tests that are uh, quick, um, that are accurate, and will allow early exclusion of patients presenting with a potential uh, myocardial infarction. So the paper that I've been asked to discuss um, is rapid exclusion of acute myocardial infarction in patients with an undetectable tr troponin using a high sensitivity assay. Uh, this was reviewed last year um, in uh, Grand Rounds by Carl, uh, and Vipin actually came and spoke about it, um, uh, sort of talking about uh, the LHSC policy and uh, the reasons why we adopted the new uh, high sensitivity troponins uh, and how it may uh, influence uh, our management. So this study, it was uh, a two-part prospective cohort study. Uh, the first one uh, was um, looking at patients that were already part of a bigger cohort, um, the uh, uh, acute vascular markings for uh, myocardial ischemia. Uh, and they, um, essentially they measured these patients uh, um, in terms of their diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction and how well um, uh, high sensitivity troponin was able to predict that outcome. The second part was then taking the high sensitivity troponin assay and actually using it and validating it clinically. Um, again, university affiliated teaching hospital similar to London, I think it's uh, fairly uh, representative in terms of uh, the type of academics that are done in, this, in the institution. Inclusion criteria, so adults, uh, the only um, real ones to sort of note here are in the exclusion criteria, they excluded patients with renal failure and potential uh, trauma resulting in myocardial contusion. Uh, there was no other uh, exclusion criteria for other reasons why somebody may have an elevated troponin. So again, their methods uh, sort of, as I discussed earlier. Uh, so initially uh, in 2006, 2007 was when the uh, acute vascular markings trial started. Uh, patients were presented, uh, they had blood drawn initially at presentation and uh, 12 hours after uh, symptom onset. Uh, that sample was then uh, spun down, frozen at, I think it's supposed to be minus 20, it says minus 200 in the paper, uh, for 48 hours, and then subsequently frozen down to minus 70. Uh, and then they had follow-up uh, at 48 hours, 30 days, and six months. Other than that, the patients were treated uh, as per uh, the decision of the emergency department physician. Uh, follow-up included uh, a search through a national mortality database uh, then uh, provided the patient was still alive. Uh, they went through their electronic health record for any subsequent emergency department visits, uh, any admissions, outpatient appointments, uh, or uh, any further investigations that were ordered. Uh, patients were contacted by phone, and if you couldn't reach them by phone, they talked with their family doctor. Uh, an amendment was made in August of 2009, so at this time, the high-sensitivity troponin assay became available. So the previous samples from 2006-2007 uh, were uh, unthawed, uh, and they were now tested for a high sensitivity troponin on the initial value. The cutoff points that they use for the uh, Roche uh, high, sens high sensitivity assay, which is the same assay that we use here, 
uh, was three nanograms per liter of the lower limit of detection uh, and 14 nanograms per liter in terms of the 99th percentile. Uh, just for a reference, um, the 50 nanograms per liter of the high sensitivity troponin is equivalent to our old 0 0.03 in a regular cardiac troponin. So their primary outcome was diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction. They also wanted to uh, evaluate the sensitivity of a high sensitivity troponin to predict uh, any future rises in cardiac troponins. And their secondary outcomes were death of all cause uh, and any uh, incident MI not including the uh, index visit. So the gold standard that they used uh, was um, two independent cardiologists were provided with all of the clinical uh, laboratory and imaging uh, data that each patient had, uh, and they then adjudicated whether or not they believed the patient had uh, or did not have a, an acute myocardial infarction. So uh, the diagnostic criteria that they used is there. It's sort of based off, again, that uh, sort of universal definition of what an AMI is. Um, and again, the, the key thing here is that uh, the initial diagnosis made by emergency physician um, was uh, based on their clinical suspicion. So then uh, in part two is when the assay was actually introduced into clinical practice in this institution. So they, for, they inst introduced it in January. They just sort of let people um, use it uh, in their, uh, in their clinical, um, with their clinical judgment over three months. Then they, they went back and looked at patients that had at least two high sensitivity troponins drawn in that three month period. Uh, and they required them to have one uh, at least 12 hours from symptom onset. Uh, and then they went to calculate the ability of the high sensitivity troponin to predict future, future rises um, uh, on subsequent uh, measurements. And again, so for both, uh, both of the high sensitivity troponins and the cardiac troponins, they looked at the ability um, sorry, at the sensitivity, specificity, and the positive and negative predictive values at both the 99th percentile, which would be 14 nanograms per liter, and at the very lower limit of detection, which would be three nanograms per liter. So their results, so they had um, 703 patients that were uh, included in the study. Uh, there is, initially, there was 804 patients that were eligible, but 93, uh, there was uh, a serum sample missing uh, three patients withdrew, and there were a few other patients that somehow managed to squeak in there that didn't actually meet the uh, inclusion criteria. Um, they were, the baseline characteristics were essentially the same between the groups that had uh, myocardial infarction and those that did not, except for patients that had uh, an AMI tended to be a little bit older, 63 versus 57, and uh, they had a, 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 um, more smokers in that group. They had none no patients were actually lost to follow-up. Uh, the mean time of onset uh, of symptoms to um, blood draw was 3.5 hours, and that was the same in both groups. Uh, and 18.5% of the patients uh, in this study uh, were uh, diagnosed with acute MI uh, that was uh, adjudicated and agreed by the two independent investigators. Uh, and at six months, 30 patients had either uh, an MI or had died. Uh, there were uh, 15 deaths uh, and 21 uh, acute MIs with six patients in the acute MI group uh, subsequently dying. So just sort of looking a little bit more specifically at the results, uh, there's sort of two ways of looking at um, the patients that presented. You can look at them in terms of time to presentation. Uh, and so that would be time to first uh, blood draw and measure of high sensitivity troponin. And you can look at them in terms of what their actual uh, initial uh, high sensitivity proponent was. So what I've shown here in the prospective cohort uh, is um, that essentially no patients that presented uh, with a, trope, a high sensitivity troponin less than three went on to have uh, an acute MI. This was again using the lower limit of detection of the assay, which is three nanograms per liter. Uh, and this allowed in this study 27.7% of patients to be excluded uh, with an initial high sensitivity troponin. Uh, that was undetectable. The other thing to note is uh, that in that 3 to 14 nanograms uh, per liter range, which would still technically fall under the 99th percentile, 6.4% uh, of the patients in that group, uh, so 19 out of the 296, uh, had a, an MI. And in the group of greater than 14 nanograms per liter, 52% uh, of patients within that group uh, went on to have an MI. They don't give us a breakdown in terms of, uh, you know, greater than 14 is just greater than 14. Not sure exactly if they had 1,000 or if they had 
23, what their trope value was. So when they went on uh, and they performed a sensitivity analysis uh, for uh, the ability of uh, initial uh, high sensitive troponin to predict uh, any future uh, elevations in cardiac troponin, uh, uh, the sensitivity was essentially 100% they calculated. Uh, and again, they took this and they validated it in clinical practice uh, and they came up as well with a sensitivity of 100%. Looking at uh, time um, of presentation uh, and um, uh, incidence of uh, myocardial infarction, Again, patients, um, patients that presented within three hours actually accounted for 46% of all the patients in the study. Uh, they, uh, had, um, they were 60% of all of the myocardial infarctions overall. Uh, and within that group of zero to three hours, uh, they 24.3% of them uh, had an MI. And then looking at the subsequent groups, I mean, you can see, I think that as you sort of, as you move on in time, there's fewer and fewer patients that are representative of that time of presentation. So people that had, had symptoms for greater than 12 hours only, were up, uh, only presented, or only represented 8.7% of the patients in this study. So the only thing that I really wanted to point out here, and this is a terrible slide, very busy, but uh, the confidence intervals uh, around um, patients presenting uh, at different time points. So the overall uh, sensitivity, they said, is 100 with a confidence interval of 97.2 to 100. Uh, if you move farther in time, those confidence inter intervals widen. Uh, and again, that uh, is because of the, the fewer patients they had that were representative of that time of presentation. So just something to keep in mind. And then finally, when you're evaluating uh, any diagnostic test, you want to actually look at the likelihood ratio. Uh, you know, how, uh, how useful is it in changing your pretest probability uh, uh, in your uh, post-test probability? So looking at uh, the less than three nanograms per liter, they have a negative likely rate, likelihood ratio of essentially zero. Uh, in terms of the um, 14 nanograms per liter, still, I mean, in terms of the positive likelihood ratio, does it maybe shift your, uh, you know, your post-test probability? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Depends on your clinical suspicion. So I think, the, again, the, the main take-home point of this slide is that um, besides the negative likelihood ratio for less than three, um, it's, they're very much, it's, this is all dependent on your clinical suspicion. And... So their conclusion was, uh, in adults presenting to the emergency department with suspicion of cardiac chest pain, uh, a high sensitivity trope of less than three ruled out acute MI. Um, again, this could enable them to exclude up to 30% of patients uh, uh, within uh, the first, um, with the first troponin. Uh, and they also had a very low risk of significant adverse events uh, within six months. So the limitations of the study, uh, the exclusion criteria, which I mentioned earlier, um, this, I mean, the gold standard and the methods, it's, I don't know if this is necessarily, they don't state per se what happened to the patients uh, after they were discharged from the emergency department. They state that the two independent investigators uh, were given all of the clinical laboratory and imaging uh, data except for the high sensitivity troponin. They never specifically state whether or not every patient uh, had uh, a similar sort of outpatient workup. Um, so that would maybe just be something that would be uh, interesting to know. The Roche assay, this is the only one, according to Vipin in the lab, that is available, uh, at least in, uh, you know, within our, uh, our, our center. Um, so the reference limit of 14 nanograms per liter, uh, that's the 99th percentile as determined uh, in an otherwise uh, assumed healthy population. Um, the samples were collected and they were stored at minus 20 degrees for up to 48 hours and then they were frozen down to minus 70 degrees and kept for over two years. They were then thawed and tested uh, for high sensitivity troponin at that time. Uh, it doesn't, there's no data on how stable high sensitivity troponin is. Um, there is, you know, it says on the ROSA assay here that you can keep it for 12 months at minus 20 degrees. Uh, there has been no further uh, studies done on how stable it is over the long period of time. Uh, and again, we contacted the lab here and they were uh, not for, uh, able to provide us with any further information on that. And 
The biggest limitation, I think, of the high sensitivity troponin assay is the balance between increasing sensitivity and decreasing specificity. So when you have a troponin that's less than three, that's fairly, I mean, it's very useful. Uh, you can uh, exclude acute myocardial infarction. But what do you do with those patients that are in the gray zone? And I just brought this slide up again. So those patients that are sort of, oh, I don't have a pointer, but they're in the three to 14 or even the greater than 14. Um, uh, the patients in the three to 14 nanograms, you know, they had 6.4% uh, of them had an acute MI. Uh, and, uh, you know, 14 is the upper, is the 99th percentile. Uh, and again, our previous cardiac troponin of 0 0.03 is equal to 50 nanograms per liter. So patients that we were previously sending home, even with uh, you know, repeat values that were still less than 0 0.03, we're now presented with maybe a new diagnostic dilemma as what do we do uh, with these patients. And again, as I mentioned before, the confidence intervals around uh, late versus early presenters are just something to keep in mind. Uh, when uh, assessing uh, the result of the study. So, I mean, the key from uh, sort of all this is that uh, high sensitivity troponin um, is uh, useful in terms of ruling out something in terms of, but you always have to base it off your clinical suspicion. Um, it's not a definition, it's not cut and dry of normal versus abnormal. Uh, it's very much dependent on the patient, the history they're given, uh, and uh, you know what your pretest probability is. So, in general, when you're implementing a new test, uh, it can, a new test can be integrated into your system in one of three ways. It either replaces an old test. Uh, it uh, is something that's added um, before an old test, so that only patients with particular results of a new test will go on along the clinical pathway. Uh, or it can be placed after an old test, so that only patients with particular results on the old test may need the further uh, addition of this new test. So when you're evaluating as to where uh, a, a new test would go, you want to look at, again, your likelihood ratios, what's your pretest probability, uh, you know, how much or how little will the new test uh, influence uh, your, uh, you know, your pretest and your post-test probability. So in LHSC, we have chosen to uh, place high sensitivity troponin uh, here. It's replaced our previous cardiac troponin. And our algorithm, that, for those of you that haven't seen it posted everywhere. Um, so just to go quickly through, just the you know, standard Gordon Guyot uh, evidence-based. Uh, did the participants, essentially, are the results valid? Uh, yes, they provide a diagnostic dilemma. Um, we are uh, assuming that they all um, had the same reference standard testing done uh, regular cardiac workup. They do not mention doing an ECG in the paper, um, but we, I think it's probably safe to assume that you'd hope one would have been done. Um, were they blinded? Yes. Uh, and uh, again, the reference standard, we're going to assume that they all had a very similar workup. Uh, so I would say yes for that. And can you apply it to uh, our patients? Um, it is reproducible. We were actually using the exact same assay that they tested here. Uh, in terms of interpretation, uh, I think that we can, but we don't use the same values as this study. Uh, this study used a delta of 20, uh, and we use a delta of 10. Um, so it's something just to keep in mind. And the other questions in terms of will the results change my management, uh, will patients be better off, we'll maybe have that discussion after Marilyn uh, presents uh, the, further, the second study. So the bottom line is high sensitivity troponin is very useful when it's undetectable. Uh, and it can assist in excluding uh, acute MI. Um, but we may now have a new diagnostic dilemma as to what to do with patients who fall uh, sort of within that gray zone below the previous cardiac troponin cutoff, um, but now uh, you know, within that zone of uh, potentially needing to go on for further workup.